Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Mr. Moser's Meandering Monday. This is part two of the Kings Mountain National Military Park. If you didn't see part one, you might want to go back and watch that episode, just so you know what's going on. I want to say once again, a big thank you goes out to Ranger Jim Sahi, who gave me a lot of information about the park and the battle itself. Let's listen to him now. The Patriots, there were, there were, there were more than 900 on their way here. Um, there were several thousand. And the intelligence was that, hey, um, Ferguson's up on, on what's known as Kings Mountain. So he stopped here uh, to encamp. He, he knew that the Patriots were kind of after him. He had made a bold statement, you know, uh, to the Overmountain men, if you don't cease your, your violent activity, I'm going to come over and lay waste your country with fire and sword. Well, their interpretation of that was, eh, I'm going to come get you first, you know. So eventually, um, he was aware that they were coming for him. He uh, requested uh, reinforcements. Um, General Cornwallis was in Charlotte. And so he was trying to get reinforcements. So it's thought that he stayed here, um, one, because his task was to to be in the general area recruiting, and he was hoping for reinforcements to come. High ground is great, unless you can be surrounded on all sides, which is exactly what happened. He had no way out. Um, so the loyalists on top, again, they were mostly uh, militia, but the uh, the American, British, you know, British provincials, redcoats, if you will, uh, there was about 120 of them. And this little map shows where they were from. So they were from Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. This maybe isn't an accurate description, but the way I think about it is, if you think about the current military and how it's structured, these guys would have been Ferguson's like special forces, you know? Uh, they would have been the ones training the militia. Um, and uh, there was three bayonet charges here down in this direction. And, um, it was not a failed attempt, but after three tries, they gave up. Um, and what was happening was you had the British provincials charging down the hill at the Patriots. Now, again, the Patriots, it takes a minute to load their rifle, right? So what's a Patriot going to do if he shoots and there's still this maniac running at him with a red coat and a bayonet? He's going to run. And that's exactly what they did. And it wasn't a matter of cowardice, but... The smart thing to do is run, put some distance between them, reload, and then come back at it. And so that kind of ebbed and flowed three times, and then finally they gave up the bayonet attack. So this is the uh, newest monument on the battlefield, uh, October 7, 2016, uh, dedicated to the three known uh, African-American patriots who served here, uh, who fought uh, in the battle on the side of the Patriots. So it's believed that there were more, um, but the park won't claim something unless they can prove it 100%. And so without a doubt, the documentation shows that they were here. Um, the other story I like to tell is uh, a woman by the name of Mary Patton. She was up in um, Tennessee and she made gunpowder. That's what she did. Uh, it's believed that she learned it from her Irish father and uncle and so she had a little factory and she manufactured gunpowder and she actually supplied 500 pounds to the patriots as they were coming down from tennessee and so 500 pounds of gunpowder is a lot of gunpowder that was used at this battle you know and so you think well we talk about the guys charging up the hill they were brave but if you ask me mary pat was pretty brave because she would have i would imagine she'd have been swinging from a rope if the british had you know, caught her, you know. So um, those are some of the stories that, you know, we want to make sure that we're telling. So this is the Centennial Monument put up in 1880 for the Centennial of the battle. And uh, it's aging, but it's it's holding up. Yep, so placed in 1880, uh, 28 feet tall. Uh, the elevation we're at right here is 1,045 feet. And um, the difference in elevation from the highest point to the uh, visitor center is uh, about 180 feet. So we're probably at the, I believe this is the highest point. 
uh, on the battlefield. So the Loyalists would have been positioned in this on this ridge line right here. Um, again, maybe not all of the provincials, but at least some of them were on this end, which is where the columns came from. And so that's why I'm sure the bayonet uh, charge happened in this area because it was where the where the largest mass of people was. Even though they broke into two columns, then two more columns, and surrounded on all sides. I would assume that they chose this place to do the bayonet charge just to uh, keep them from approaching on this smaller end of the mountain. You'll see that when we get down to the other end, it's much wider. Um, but you know, uh, after the, the, the bayonet uh, attacks uh, didn't really get the job done, Patriots were coming up. Now again, now that we're on the top of the mountain, you can, you can picture the Patriots coming up on both sides and you can see just how small the ridge line is. Um, and a lot of the loyalists were getting caught in the crossfire because you had, you know, Patriots coming up on both ends and there was nowhere for them to go. The Patriots were coming up, loyalists are getting caught in the crossfire and they start heading down this way, probably out of lack of any other uh, option. Again, the mountain spreads out, gets uh, wider here. So uh, the battle lasted right around an hour. So it was pretty quick into the battle where the, the loyalists started to push in this direction. Patriots lost 29 killed and 58 wounded out of 900. The Loyalists had 250 dead, 163 wounded, and then 668 captured. The area where the the, uh, the large monument is, that's that's where uh, Ferguson had his headquarters. He had the, um, his wagons were encircled. They had about 12 supply wagons. And that's ultimately where the surrender ended up taking place. Um, so it was a complete Patriot victory. So yeah, this, this, uh, this is what we call the U.S. Monument. So it was dedicated in 1909, uh, 83 feet tall. The elevation here is 960 feet. The inside is brick and then the granite is on the outside, but I think there's a hollow core um, that that's, goes up all the way through. The DAR did a, a lot, um, you know, went, went, after the battle, the, the Daughters of the American Revolution purchased 40 acres, They're basically this area right where the battlefield is. So luckily they preserved that very early on. Uh, now we sit on 4,000 acres. Uh, the state park used to be federal land as well, and that's another 6,000, so it's 10,000 acres here. So, um, but as far as the actual battlefield goes, there's no telling what would have happened had it just you know, remained farmland or whatever, you know. But uh, the DAR bought it and then, you know, preserved it. That was pretty early on, early 1800s. The sign on the monument says, on this field, the Patriot forces attacked and totally defeated an equal force of Tories and British regular troops. The British commander, Major Patrick Ferguson, was killed and his entire force was captured after suffering heavy loss. This brilliant victory marked the turning point of the American Revolution. So here's uh, Major Patrick Ferguson. So um, that stone right down there is actually where he fell. Um, he was, um, again, he was injured at the Battle of Brandywine, so he did not have uh, use of one of his hands. So he um, would basically have a silver whistle and his men were trained to understand the commands based on whistling. And he had a, a saber in his other hand. Um, and uh, he did wear a red and white checkered hunting uh, frock or um, like what you see there. Um, they call it a duster. But yeah, he, he was shot, uh, some accounts say seven or eight times. He was, he was uh, really well thought of by his men. Uh, they called him the bulldog just because he, he kind of knew how to get what he wanted and, and went about it. Uh, but he was good to his men and um, he had a reputation for being a really good tactician. So I think even the other side, the Patriot side, had, had a certain level of respect for him. But yeah, so he is buried down at the bottom of the hill so, you know, he had the, his two female servants. Uh, they were both named Virginia. Um, one of them was killed. Uh, she was trying to escape the battle. Uh, she's buried with him, and they, they've confirmed that. I want to say they dug it up in the, um, 
late 1800s and confirmed that there's a, a man and a woman's body in there. And then more recently, there was ground penetrating radar done. Uh, so they are both in there. After your tour of the battlefield, you can go in the visitor center. It also has a gift shop where you can get all sorts of items related to the battle, hats, toys, books, etc. It also has a small museum that you can go through. You can even learn more about the people that fought in the battle, some of the artifacts, some of the weapons that were used, clothing, and more. And if you want to see a recreation of the battle, you can go into their small movie theater and watch a 26 minute documentary about the battle and the people involved. The name of the commander whose troops were butchered at Waxhaws by the British. Ferguson's men I want to say thank you once again to Ranger Jim Sahey for the valuable information he shared with us today. I hope you enjoyed today's video and maybe learned a little something. So I want to wish everyone a great summer. I'll be coming back to you with more new episodes starting this fall. Have a great day.